Hi everyone, this is Leonardo Cavenaghi. I am from Brazil, but now I am postdoc at the University of Fribourg. And today I will split my lecture in two videos. I hope that it's not that long. And the title of my talk is On the Geometry of Smooth Structures, Prescribing Scalar Curvature with Symmetries. Uh, namely, uh, I will show approach the kasdan warner problem on determining which functions are the scalar curvature for some Riemannian metrics on manifolds, uh, adding the hypothesis that the manifolds carry an isometric effective action by a Lie group. This way, we search for uh, the answer to the question which g invariant functions can be prescribed as the scalar curvature for g invariant remaining metrics. But in order to motivate our work, I will start by recalling the relationship between the topological space, the smooth structure, and the geometry. For instance, I recall that uh, a well known application of geometry is its own usage to the understanding of manifolds as topological spaces as it can be seen on the classical Bonnet-Meyers theorem and the differentiable sphere theorem and also, more recently, on the Poincaré conjecture. But then, the related question, given a class of smooth manifolds, which are the admissible geometries on this class, it remains unsolved for almost every manifold. Namely, if one consider a manifold that a smooth manifold uh, is not known for almost every class of smooth manifold, which are its admissible geometries. Moreover, I recall that there are the very interesting examples of exotic spheres, which I shall note by sigma n. And then, this, um, these manifolds are, uh, are smooth manifolds that are homeomorphic to the standard classical sphere, but not the field morph to it, as first introduced by John Milner. And there is this more general question that is widely open and is do exotic spheres admit similar geometries to classical spheres? So uh, it's been a long journey trying to answer this question. A lot of research, research has been done and I would like to, just to emphasize some of the results. For instance, uh, a great result that perhaps uh, led to the first glance that uh, exotic spheres should carry similar geometries to classical spheres are the construction of a Gromo-Meyer exotic sphere, where they put a metric of non-negative sectional curvature on a seven-dimensional exotic sphere. Later, Fred Wilhelm constructed metrics of positive rich curvature and almost non-negative sectional curvature in every exotic sphere of dimension seven. Later, Grove Ziller and more recently Goethe, Kerry, and Shankar built metrics of non negative sectional curvature on all of these manifolds of dimension 7. And which concern manifolds with positive rich curvature, exotic spheres with positive rich curvature? A lot of work has been done. For instance, Nash, Poor, Sirle Wilhelm, Wright, Hawking, and Crowley. Prove the existence of metrics of positive rich curvature on severe exotic manifolds. Now, I would like to, to, to remark that it's not known if there is an exotic sphere with a metric of positive sectional curvature. Moreover, Grove, Verdiani, Vuk, and Ziller, they showed that there are some, some exotic spheres that are named as curvature spheres that do not admit homogeneity to one matrix of non-negative sectional curvature. Therefore, it cannot exist a metric with lots of symmetries that has positive sectional curvature on some exotic manifolds. And uh, in, in contrast with it, uh, Nigel Hitching proved that there are exotic spheres that do not even admit metrics of positive scalar curvature. It all raises the question, to which extent do differentiable structures determine the geometry? Well, and just as I said, in this talk I shall approach the problem by the means of studying which scalar curvature functions are admissible on exotic manifolds. And is there a way that the same functions, the same scalar curvature functions can be realized on both classical and exotic manifolds? 
To begin with, I start recalling some developments on the problem of prescribed scalar curvature. It always started with the classical Yamaha problem that stated as given a closed move remain a manifold, thus this manifold admit a metric of constant scalar curvature on a conformal class of G. Well, uh, it, uh, it started with Yamaber and later it was moved on by Schrodinger, Alban, Shaw, Sean in the all and today uh, this in, as just as is, it was stated here it is completely solved and um, it, it's known that uh, all compact manifolds admit such a metric. To the case where uh, M is the, uh, the standard sphere and we begin with uh, the round metric on the sphere namely the metric with constant sectional curvature uh, it poses the question is it true that any positive smooth function can be realized as the scalar curvature of some pointwise conformal Riemannian metric to the to the classical to the round metric. This is more or less open. And there are lots of results proving that um, the condition that uh, the function is positive it does not suffice. For instance, there are other obstructions concerning the symmetries of this function, uh, but uh, the definite answer as as far as I know, is open. And there is the custom warner approach, that is, given uh, the, uh, not only an approach, but also a problem, that is, given a smooth function on a closed Riemannian manifold, under which condition this function can be prescribed as the scalar curvature of either a pointwise conformal metric to G or a conformally equivalent metric to G. So what do I mean by conformally equivalent? I mean that it is pointwise conformal to G up to the pullback by the diffeomorphism. Okay, and some answers given by Kazdan and Warner are if a, such a function that you want to prescribe is everywhere negative, then it is the scalar curvature of a pointwise conformal metric to G. On the other hand, if this such a function is negative somewhere, then there exists a diffeomorphism of the manifold such that f is the scalar curvature of some pointwise conformal metric to the pullback by such a diffeomorphism. Another related result is what is known as a direct approach on prescribing scalar curvature. For instance, given our closed Riemannian manifold with a metric G and we consider scal G as the scalar curvature of this metric. Suppose you want to prescribe some smooth function, then uh, it's known that and this is also given by Kazdan and Warner that if there exists some constant C such that such inequality here is satisfied, then such an F can be prescribed as the scalar curvature for some remaining metric. Moreover, if G the metric has positive constant scalar curvature, then any of such function can be prescribed as the scalar curvature for some remaining metric on the manifold. Well, from now on, we assume we have a closed Riemannian manifold of dimension at least three, and we also assume that there is an isometric action by a compact and connect Lie group G on this manifold. You assume that there is at least an orbit of positive dimension. Namely, if we considered all the orbits of this action on the manifold, we ask that at least one orbit has positive dimension. This uh, it suffices, for instance, to ask that the Lie group G is compact but not discrete. Okay, uh, and then we have the following: given any non-positive smooth G invariant function, then if such a function satisfies this inequality here where mi g of m stands for the volume of the manifold, 2 star is the critical exponent, Sobolev exponent, that is uh, 2n over n minus 2, minus 2, where n is the dimension of the manifold. If, if this inequality is satisfied, then there exists a g-invariant Riemannian metric on the manifold that realizes this function as a scalar curvature. Okay, this is a first result and uh, I also should have mentioned that uh, this work is joint with Professor João Marcos Duó and Lohan Esperança, so all the theorems that I shall state, well, they were obtained in partnership with them. 
Okay, so this is our first result. And we also have this result here that follows more naturally the Yamab problem. Namely, given any positive constant, if then our metric has positive scalar curvature or even more, uh, or even lesser, sorry, if it has no negative scalar curvature, but it has positive scalar curvature on one point, then we can realize this constant C as the scalar curvature for some G invariant Riemannian metric. Okay? And uh, I remark that uh, having uh, the property of positive of the property of admitting a metric of constant positive scalar curvature on the symmetric case is only obstructed by the action. For instance, if the group is non-abelian, uh, myself, uh, Renato Silva and Loja Esperanza proved some years ago that if it, the, the, the Lie group G is non-abelian or if it has non-abelian Lie algebra, then any metric that we start on the manifold develop positive scalar curvature after we know after what a procedure that is is named Tigger deformation okay this uh, there is this result of Lawson Yao that every Riemannian manifold with an F, uh, with an effective action by a non abelian Lie group admits a matrix of positive scalar curvature our theorem it gives the small improvement that well we can keep the initial structure structure group of the manifold. So this is needed here and then we obtain a scholarly that if G is a non-abelian, is non-abelian, then any smooth G invariant function is the scalar curvature for some G invariant remaining metric on the manifold. And this is possible just because we have that uh, under the presence of non-abelian symmetry, you have a metric of positive scalar curvature. So we apply this theorem to conclude that every constant is the scalar curvature for some remaining metric and by the theorem about the direct approach of Kasdell Warner we can realize um, any function any g invariant function as the scalar curvature for some g invariant remaining metric uh, i shall present this on the second part of my lecture but for now uh, i just um, say to you that I have uh, we obtained an analogous result to this one of Kazdan Warner in this scenario. But for now, I would like to proceed by giving some details on the proof of this theory. And the the natural approach is of course searching for conformal change of the initial metric leading to the following PD which has the, the this nonlinear part here given by n plus 2 over n minus 2, where n is the dimension of the manifold. We have this other constant here. And we can associate to this equation the following energy functional. Okay? Here, to start, if you can think that is just the critical exponent, that is 2n over n minus 2, or even if you want, it is just gamma n plus 1. So we have to deal with this uh, energy functional here. We assume that the scalar curvature uh, and the function we want to prescribe f are continuous function. In this manner, this functional is of class C1. And then uh, the idea is try to find minimizers for this functional that are critical points for it. Well, uh, as most of you may know, this is quite difficult because the existence of this critical exponent here. Um, there is this highly Kondrakov classical theorem stating that we can take compact embeddings from the double one to uh, uh, Sobolev space to LP for P at most, but not included to star. But here we have this two star. So what can we do? Well, it happens that if we consider functions on the manifold that are G invariant, namely these functions are constant along the orbits of the group action on the manifold, then it's possible to define the analogous Sobolev space here just by taking the closure according to this norm. And in this scenario of manifolds with symmetries, the Sobolev space can be larger embedded on LP spaces. 
assuming that there exists an orbit of positive dimension. So this is the trick here. We can deal with this, uh, this, this elliptic PD here with this nonlinearity by considering this functional and trying variational methods see, uh, under the presence of an, uh, under the existence of an orbit with positive dimension. And this is guaranteed by this larger embed theorem here. Namely, we can embed uh, up to, to some P0 that is strictly greater than the critical exponent. And then uh, the problem becomes solvable by the means of variational methods. So now it's very simple to, to, how, to how to approach the problem. Uh, we consider the Sobolev space here of G invariant function, of G, which elements are uh, G invariant in an appropriate sense, sense and namely, these are, these, these are the elements of the space are just this closure here by this norm. And then we consider this function now here, just define it on that Sobolev space. And then by standard, very standard um, variational methods, we can show that there is uh, no empty weakly, weakly closed G invariant subset of the Sobolev space, uh, such that uh, the restriction of J to this, this subset is coercive, and it's also weakly lower semi-continuous, and therefore by the Fermat principle uh, or Fermat theorem, uh, no, uh, yes, Fermat theorem, uh, this function almost has a symmetric critical point. By symmetrical critical point, I mean that if we take the first variation of the functional on this minimal point, but just taking variations uh, on the directions of G invariant elements, then uh, we the, the, the first Taylor expansion is zero. So we have a symmetrical critical point in this sense that on, on G variant directions, the, function, the functional vanishes. But then we can apply the classical principle of symmetric criticality of Palais to conclude that there is a smooth, uh, a, a weak solution. And to deal with regularity theory of elliptic PDs, um, to just to ensure the existence of smooth solutions, uh, we can simply see that the, the critical, the most difficult exponent here to treat. So if we take, for instance, the operator just given by uh, this part here. Um, so we have to deal with this nonlinearity, but um, this linearity can be, by the regularity of PDs can be treated to give a smooth solution as long as scalar curvature and F are smooth. Uh, if we search for solutions with bounded uh, essential supremum, so uh, this closet set here, it has the hypothesis of also its elements has finite essential supremum. So everything works uh, in also for for to guarantee that the this, the the metric obtained by the conformal change is is smooth indeed. And the classical maximum principle implies that the solution must be positive, okay? But now I would like to talk to you a little bit about the direct approach on prescribing scalar curvature for G, uh, of uh, prescribing G invariant functions as the scalar curvature for G invariant metrics. And I will continue this on the next uh, part of the, the, the lecture, but for now I just, looked, I just wanted to show you the statement of this result and to show you that these this are quite similar to the one of the Kasdan Warner. So here it's written that the, the action is regular. Oh, no, this is this is wrong. We don't need that the action is regular. This would mean that um, every uh, every point every point has has every two points has they have conjugate isotropy isotropy subgroups. Namely, each point uh, is such that each pair of points is such that the group of fixing subgroup of G fixing such points they are conjugate to each other. But this is not the case. We don't really need it here. We so we can just uh, do not consider it. And the statement of the theorem is that any smooth G invariant function on the manifold that satisfies the following inequality 
can be realized as the scalar curvature for some g invariant Riemannian metric on the manifold. This is the statement of the theorem. On the second part, part of the lecture, I shall make a sketch about how do we prove it and also see some applications, so see you very soon.